Hey, welcome to the, today's video. I'm Brian Nash, the host of the How We, uh, we Got Here podcast. And today I'm uh, releasing on video um, recordings from one of my favorite podcasts I've had to do. Um, it's one of my favorite guests. Um, I've had him twice on the show. Um, first to talk about his book, um, Canada's Ulster Scots. And today, uh, on, in this uh this podcast that I did back on March 3rd this year, um, he's talking about his book, The Loyalists of Digby. Um, so I'm really excited to have him on the show. Um, you know, I'm inviting you to stick around to the end. Um, after the interview, I'll be coming back uh, and telling you how you can win, get a chance to win an autographed copy of his book. So today's... Uh, video and today's guest is um, Brian McConnell from he's he's a retired recently retired lawyer uh, author uh, and genealogist and United Empire loyalist and he's he, I was really excited to have him back on so here's the podcast I'd like to welcome back to the How We Got Here podcast, Brian McConnell. I've had him before. He was talking about his book, um, Canada's Ulster Scots. And today he's going to be talking about his latest book, The Loyalist of Digby. Um, so, Brian, as uh, we uh, get started here, just what was the inspiration for, uh, for, for doing this book and specifically concentrating on the community of Digby? You know, just uh, by way of a bit of background, Brian, uh, for someone who may not know, uh, I've been involved in the Loyalist Association in Nova Scotia for a number of years, the United Empire Loyalists, and am presently the president of the Nova Scotia branch. And I'm descended from a soldier who served in the uh, Loyal Rangers during the American Revolution. I have no, no ancestors in Nova Scotia, but I have lived for over 30 years near Digby. And I've been writing and researching on local history here, having belonged to a, a few of the historical societies. Of course, you don't have to go very far. The name it tells it itself, Digby named after Admiral Digby, who was responsible for providing the ships to send the Loyalists here. As a historian, it's a, it's, to me, it's a, a very fascinating subject. And where you where did the the loyalists in Digby where did they primarily come from well this happened in uh, june of 1783 when the uh, loyalist refugees were being evacuated from new york at the end of the american revolution when the treaty was done between the british government and the americans um, they provided uh, that the loyalists there could all be withdrawn. So Sir Guy Carleton, the British commander, was based in New York. Uh, he was the commander for all British forces in North America and had charge for this, along with Admiral Robert Digby, who'd been a, a naval captain, served in the Channel Fleet in the Mediterranean, and was appointed as a station commander of New York, which meant that he commanded all of the ships based out of New York. So there were a number of sailings. There was a, a spring sailing, a summer sailing, and a fall sailing of loyalists from New York to Nova Scotia, which then included New Brunswick. So as part of this, they, some ships went to Shelburne, some went to Digby and Annapolis Royal, 
Uh, others went to St. John, the, uh, at the mouth of the St. John River, transporting in total, it's estimated uh, in the vicinity of 30,000 loyalists over a six month period. This included uh, United Empire loyalists as well as black loyalists. And um, to, to be considered a, a, a loyalist per se, did, was there, was it just a matter you had to have been in those American territories and were evacuated or um, I know, I know with the, some of the soldiers that served, they were given land grants and those are specifically considered loyalists. Um, so is there like a requirement for the military service or just any act of service on behalf of the, the king? That's right, Brian. There are two different categories of claimants. The military claimants uh, who could have been uh, Americans who resided in the colonies prior to the start of the conflict in 1776 uh, and joined a loyalist regiment and then served throughout the revolution. Examples of that would be the New Jersey Volunteers and the New York Volunteers, the King's Orange Rangers, all based around the New York, New Jersey area, as well as uh, civilian claimants. These were people who uh, provided some type of assistance to uh, the British forces. They could have been merchants, uh, they could have been spies, uh, they could have provided uh, ships, supplies, uh, farming gear, uh, but they had to be able to provide some type of documentation to show, to substantiate that they had done this. Then when they came to Nova Scotia, they were eligible for land grants based on the type of claimant they were. Um, depending on your military service, the higher rank received the greater number of, of acreage. Um, then down to civilian claimants uh, received a, a basic amount of 100 acres uh, for a civilian. Now, uh, that could increase depending on the number in the family. Uh, for children, if in some families when they came, it was quite common to have father, son, brothers, um, three or more who had all been active in some way in the Loyalist cause. Okay, so it, it is as, as simple as the name sounds. You had to be loyal to the king. Um, the, the military service wasn't required, but that gave you more privileges or, or when you got here, at least as far as land is concerned. Um, so how many loyalists settled in Digby? I know we talked a little bit about this before we actually started recording um, in comparison like other places like um, Shelburne, which St. John, which are more sort of where you a lot of people think where a lot of the loyalists wound up. Well, initially there were there were seven ships that left New York. The first ship to arrive was the Atlanta. Uh, in total, slightly over 1,300 loyalists. Uh, that would include the United Empire loyalists as well as their servants also considered to be uh, black slaves uh, who arrived in the area. Now, in addition to that, uh, there was a, a regiment, a black, free black regiment called the Black Pioneers. Uh, they were transported to Annapolis Royal uh, and uh, subsequently, they uh, petitioned the Nova Scotia House of Assembly for land, land grants, and to be treated no differently, not to be discriminated against in, in receiving land grants. So the Nova Scotia Assembly created a settlement outside of the town of Digby called Brindley Town, 76 one-acre lots, uh, which were provided to each of these uh, former black pioneers. Now, as time, as, as events transpired, um, perhaps as many as 80% of them left to Sierra Leone uh, in the um, departure of a large number of the black loyalists who decided to go there and have the opportunity to return to their homeland and, and um, have what they perceived to be greater freedom. Definitely. I mean, it, you said they, they petition have equal status, uh, one acre. 
parcels the parcels does not seem as equal as you know the even the the hundred for the the non well the, the civilian the, the loyalists the uh, that arrived in in Digby initially they were eligible for town lots and the town lots again were were of a smaller size as okay. well um, the difficulty which was experienced in both cases was there there was a shortage of supplies and a shortage of surveyors. So the creation of the town lots and the survival of the settlement was in jeopardy from the beginning. The Digby was almost faced with famine the first spring because the ship bringing supplies from Britain due to uh, unfortunate prevailing winds arrived late. Uh, and then the people were avoid, uh, were provided lots just by number and not by location or measurement or size. So it led to mass confusion as to where the properties might be situated and where they could be situated. There was a common um, assignment of property to blacks and free blacks and United Empire laws on St. Mary's Bay. However, at that time as well, in order to you received the land free, which meant that you didn't have to pay for it to be surveyed, but you had to live up to certain conditions. You had to occupy it. You had to improve it. If you didn't do that, then it could fall back to the crown. The difficulty as well in, in Digby's case, when it was chosen as a site, don't forget, we, we all, re all remember the expulsion of the Acadians which had happened um, decades before this. Well, after they, they had left or, or been dispersed, uh, the planters arrived uh, from New England. And the planters largely received the most fertile land up the valley. Uh, and land around Halifax was already spoken for. So when the loyalists did arrive, uh, there wasn't a lot of choice as to where to put them. The ones that came to Digby, it was selected largely because instead of New Brunswick, the military regiments that I had mentioned, uh, their commanders had their eye on the St. John River. They wanted to settle their soldiers together um, for defensive purposes. In the event of any future conflict, it would be easier to call them up and, and assemble them to protect the area. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, it's unfortunate they they chose St. John for for Digby's sake. I mean, it could have been much different hi history um, of the community. Now, um, of those settlers, you said that the, those loyalists that originally arrived. Th there's still a, a fair percentage of people that would be able to derive that they they are part of that loyalist group where, compared to some other places where they sort of dispersed. Um, yes, when, when we think of the Loyalists, the, in looking through the uh, records, probably uh, approximately 70% of these were Americans. They had lived in the U.S. for a, a few generations, and for whatever reason, they had decided they just didn't want to be part of the, of the revolution. Uh, then the remainder seemed to have been the largest group I've come across were, were Irish, interestingly enough, then Scots, then German and Dutch, uh, and then, uh, well, apart from that would be the, the Black Loyalists. However, it's, it's not as easy to put a number on them because some of the white Loyalists, the United Empire Loyalists who came the more affluent ones, because they were coming from America where slavery still existed, brought with them and identified them as servants, uh, when in fact they were actually black slaves. The Nova Scotia situation became more complicated because unlike the US, see then in, in Digby, you had free blacks in Brindley Town, and then you had black slaves also in Digby with United Empire Loyalists. So it, it it, it encouraged the, in time, the within the next 30 years, the abolition of 
uh, slavery within Nova Scotia. I was going to say, yeah, it was shortly thereafter that um, Nova Scotia, I think Nova Scotia was one of the first British colonies to completely abolish slavery, was it not? Um, well, yeah, Ontario got a head start in 1798. Uh, uh, Simcoe, Sir John Simcoe, he actually uh, passed a, a law uh, forbidding the trade in slaves. So that was the beginning of it. Uh, here in uh, the early 1800s, in 1810, 21 uh, slave owners in Annapolis and Digby County signed a petition, which they sent to the Nova Scotia House of Assembly. They were so fearful that slavery was going to be abolished, uh, requesting compensation in the event that slavery was abolished. Because, uh, you see, they were using uh, this free labor on their farms or in their households. Uh, the petition never became law, uh, which we'd like to hear. Yeah. And it was, it was shortly after that, that uh, slavery per se um, disappeared. However, the uh, consequences of it, as we know, have, have carried on for many years and are with us today. Uh, definitely, definitely. To, um, it's it's interesting to, to see though the the historical uh, prerogative, and I, I can imagine it. That's probably one of the choice why a lot of the the black loyalists went to Sierra Leone because they saw their neighbors possibly that were still enslaved and um, you know looking for that freedom or wondering what's going to ultimately happen to to them. Um, and so, I think. I think a lot of it too was that the, the uh, Black Loyals, as with the United Empire Loyals, hadn't experienced a Nova Scotia winter. And, and this was a, a lot of the, the, the Black slaves in, in particular, picture them coming from Georgia and North Carolina up here to face this and then not receiving the promised, let alone land, food supplies or necessities of life. Uh, that is why um, close to or greater than 50% of the white loyalists were gone, the United Empire loyalists were gone within five years. Uh, and, and a lot of them returned to the American colonies. Some went on to Ontario, some went to New Brunswick. It was just too great a challenge. And, and here in Digby, you see the greatest uh, uh, asset we have is the sea and the fishery. But a lot of these loyalists were farmers. Now, that was a skill they didn't have. You know, they would have to transition to that and that took time as well. But there, there are exceptions to the rule. I've come across deeds uh, where uh, a free black man uh, in the early 1800s, 1801, was able to purchase 200 acres of land. Uh, and he was a descendant of one of the, uh, a son of one of the black pioneers that was just outside of Digby. Um, it makes you wonder a little bit in the circumstances. I think partly too, some of the, there were different shades of slavery and, and some of the United Empire loyalists, they freed their, their servants or their black slaves not that long after they arrived here or in their will, they made provision for them to be, to be freed or depending on their own circumstances, if they left uh, and depending on the availability of land uh, they may have had an arrangement with them for some, some conveyance of land. I think there were both extremes. That's, that's interesting. Uh, um, I think, yeah, that's often a lot of times when we look at history, we do, we forget to, to look at that side of it, that there was um, not, not everybody, it needs to be categorized the same way just because of perception. Um, so the, uh, in, in, in this, in this book, um, recent book, Loyalists of Digby, I do give an example, which, which shows that, I mean, the, the, the black loyalists were connected to Digby all over the, the location of the Admiral Digby well, which is a prominent downtown Digby and historically connected to the loyalists when they arrived here. 
Well, the loyalists that owned that property, Jonathan Fowler, uh, there's a document in the public archives showing him selling a, a, a young black slave. So he was a, a slave owner. And then just outside of Digby, the Acaciaville Baptist Church, which is one of the members of the, um, the black churches across uh, Nova Scotia, Baptist churches across Nova Scotia. Uh, it is on land that was previously owned by Isaac Hatfield. Colonel Isaac Hatfield was also a prominent loyalist and uh, owned slaves in Digby. So it's, it, you can't really distinguish between the early years in, in terms of uh, the Loyalist settlement here between the United Empire Loyalists and the Black Loyalists. They were closely connected. I think what's helped to save the Digby community in part was that its location again, right across from St. John uh, and immigrants from other parts of Europe that were starting to arrive in the early 1800s. Uh, although perhaps a, slightly more than 50% of the United Empire Loyalists and less than that of the Black Loyalists remained, the community thrived because it also started to receive immigrants from Europe and, and other places due to its location on the Annapolis Basin and the Bay of Fundy. And you, you mentioned the, the, the people exiting it, but then there was that, um, like you said, just said the, the, the coming in of, of new people. Did loyalists from other areas resettle in Digby eventually? Was there, was there that type of movement as well? Was, was, was there anything that would have attracted people um, if, they, if they could bear the winters, I guess? Well, you, you're, you're, you hit on a good point there. I mean, they were arriving in places like Shelburne and spending the first winter in a tent. Uh, hard to fathom that. But some of the loyalists from Shelburne relocated to the Digby area and to Weymouth. Uh, the Campbell family was a good example of it. Uh, they located down to Weymouth and one of them became the Registrar of Deeds. And then another, the, the Member of Parliament for this area. Uh, as well, Port Mattoon on the South Shore. Largely, I think the loyalists were just looking to survive somewhere. And if it was difficult where they were and they heard of an opportunity somewhere else in the province, that's where they went. When Shelburne started to, to dissipate after its uh, receipt of you know, over 10,000 loyalists to begin with, and then within two decades was down to 300, they went everywhere. Some even went to Sydney, some went to where you are there in Prince Edward Island. Uh, so wherever they heard about an opportunity for land or a possibility to advance the, their position and their family's fortune. And the uh, the loyalists that that did, did stay in Digby, you, um, now is their, their, their history, what impact did they have on the community? Besides the original founding, um, you mentioned um, the land that's granted for that Baptist church. I mean, is it obvious if I was to go to Digby today, would there be things that would be obviously um, be able to, to say this is here because of um, a loyalist or there's a, a, a person, a specific loyalist that made an impact on um, Nova Scotian history, whether it's politicians, uh, ministers, possibly, I'm thinking um, those those people that would have a, sort of that lasting impact to the, today that somebody would see? Well, one example might be um, uh, Thomas Millage, uh, who was one of the loyalists. He had been a, an officer in the New Jersey Volunteers, and he was a surveyor as well. They needed surveyors desperately. Um, the town grid of the, the town plot of Digby today is what it was uh, in the 1700s. 80s when the town was established. Carlton Street was named after Sir Guy Carlton. Uh, George Street after King George III. Along the water there's an admiral's walk with uh, a cairn to the United Empire Loyalists that was placed there by Lieutenant Governor Schaffner uh, for the bicentennial of the Loyalists back in the 1980s. Uh, on the outskirts of the town you'll find the Black Cemetery which is in the location of where Brindley Town formerly was. 
Uh, it's kind of the last remnant of Brindley Town. And then uh, certainly down on the waterfront uh, on Montague Row, you have the Admiral Digby Museum, uh, which figures prominent and, and it has a, an extensive um, genealogical collection. Uh, I would say and it, it, that it's noticeable, but Digby has over the years, it, by and large Digby is known as the, the world capital of scallops, you know, and, and, and it, the fishing and uh, its fishing fleet and its harbor. Uh, so that catches a lot of interest and it's seafood. You know, people will come here for, for that. Once they get here, they may notice that uh, near the center of the town still is, is Trinity Anglican Church. Trinity was named by the loyalists who came from New York after Trinity to Anglican in New York City. Um, it, in its uh, cemetery, the earliest grave is from, the earliest headstone is for uh, Mary Getchus, 1785. Uh, her husband, Jacob Getchus, came from Philadelphia. He captained a sloop that brought uh, black loyalists to Annapolis Royal. Then uh, he turns up on the assignment of lots in the town of Digby and also outside of the town of Digby. Tragically, his wife apparently didn't survive two years. I don't know if she was a victim of famine or conditions or what. Uh, he departed Digby. He was one of those loyalists who left, like a lot of others. However, I found him in Halifax. He relocated to Halifax, where he was taxed as the captain of a ship. In, in, so he continued on in the merchant trade, uh, and he remarried. Uh, however, he didn't survive uh, another 10 years because his wife remarried again uh, after that and, and shows herself as a widow at that time. But the cemetery of Trinity Church uh, contains over 200 uh, headstones of, and many of them are original loyalists, so who started to be buried there in the 1780s uh, through the early 1800s. As well, you'll pass on the main street leaving town, Warwick Street, the uh, uh, old uh, loyalist cemetery, and it has a sign on it, 1783. This was a private cemetery that was first established on the land of Henry Rutherford. Henry Rutherford was originally believed to have been from Cork, Ireland. Uh, he resettled in New York shortly before the American Revolution, started up a mercantile, mercantile business there with George Nash. George Nash, I've traced back to Scotland. He actually appears uh, on the listing for property because he was assigned a lot in the town and a town lot and his uh, ethnicity is shown as Scottish. So there you go, Brian. <laughs> uh, George is actually the first one I'm trying to make a connection to. <laughs> He's buried in the cemetery, yeah. in that cemetery, uh, Trinity in Digby. Uh, and it's quite an impressive uh, location and the cemetery stones, uh, because of their age, unfortunately, a lot of them haven't survived that well. But there's a lot of history there. And the, the church is a rebuilt church because the first one, there was a fire. However, in that church, there are some beautiful glass windows. And at one end, there's uh, three to the Vets family. Roger Vets was the first minister of the church and a loyalist who came from New Hampshire. Okay. He's buried in that cemetery. In fact, he's buried uh, at one end of the church. So, yeah, that's when they, they used to, to bury people he right in the church. He requested yeah. that he be buried at, at one end of the church. Yeah. Um, now, the uh, the cemetery records. You said the stones are are uh, I mean aged as you would expect. Are there sources where there's good transcripts? If I want to to see see those records, is there is there a uh, a, a repository at um, where where those are available that that would be um, indexed or able to be seen? Well, I've also, uh, in, an, in an earlier book I did, uh, I published on the cemeteries and gravestones of Loyalist cemeteries and gravestones of uh, Digby Annapolis County. Uh, I include uh, a great number of those from that cemetery. Uh, photographs uh, as well as uh, the uh, inscriptions and identifying the uh, symbols that appear on the stones. There's further information at the uh, 
Admiral Digby Museum. And during the summer, they open the church. They have a summer student for tours. Uh, and they have a handout uh, which lists and identifies all the stones uh, to help you uh, if you want to go out and uh, try to find an ancestor uh, and look at that stone. Okay. Um, now, would there be um, those names you, that are, are prominent in that community that lasted, you mentioned a, f a few of them, um, that have sort of lasted in the community there that if, if I know that I'm, I have ancestors from Nova Scotia and they are, I'm suspecting they might have been um, loyalists coming from Digby, uh, other than the, the time frame, I guess, would you be a good clue. Um, but if they settled in the, the 17, what was it, 1783, they, they settled? Arrived in 1783, yes. And was there any other arrival times after? Well, no, the, they had, uh, the Loyalists had, had started to, in June, uh, the first ship arrived, and then by the fall, all of the Loyalists had arrived in Digby. Now there's also evidence, I mean, in the area, driving down Digby Neck, some of the Loyalists who dispersed from Digby went to Rossway, you'll find uh, Timpany Lane, named after Robert Timpany, uh, he was another loyalist originally from Ireland, uh, right down Digby Neck, Sandy Cove, uh, and Centerville, the Tituses. The Tituses were originally assigned lots in the town, and they relocated. Uh, even uh, Tiverton on Long Island. Uh, Tiverton was founded by Robert Outhouse. Uh, Robert Outhouse uh, was a loyalist uh, from New York. He and his brothers came originally uh, to the area, and he was one of the co-founders of, Tiv of Tiverton. Uh, he returned to New York and then with his daughter ended up going to Ontario, but uh, uh, his son, uh, other family members remained in Tiverton. And right at the very tip of uh, Digby County there in, in Westport uh, as well, you'll find uh, loyalists. Um, I don't know if you remember that they, they have a new ferry that crosses the passage there, Margaret's Justice. Uh, it's named after Margaret Davis, who was married to Ethel Davis, both loyalists. Uh, he had served uh, in the American Revolution. Uh, they're buried in the cemetery in, in Westport. And if you're down that way, you can take the trip across the ferry named after her uh, and then visit them uh, in the cemetery which is uh, quite a historic connection. She's the, the lady that the, il illustrates the land dispute again. Her deed uh, was in question. She didn't receive a proper deed. Well, she walked to Halifax. Uh, wow. She walked to Halifax to get a proper deed and, and appear before a judge and signed an affidavit. After her husband had died, he was deceased many years. Uh, she didn't walk the entire way. She she took apparently traveled by ship from Westport up to Annapolis Royal and then overland from Annapolis Royal to Halifax. Uh, that's why they call the ferry Margaret's Justice. She finally got what was owed to her. Wow, that's a that's quite the story. That's a that's a that, that should be a, a movie <laughs> almost. Uh, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know that's that story. That's a. That's well, it's, a, it's reflective of the loyalist experience here too, though, with the, the land title issue I mentioned. In, in fact, the land title issue wasn't cleared up until what was called the Hatfield Grant, which came uh, in the 1800s. Um, before that, uh, they'd had the Botsford Grant, the first grant of land. Uh, Amos Botsford was a Connecticut lawyer, also a loyalist, who was appointed by Sir Guy Carleton uh, to help settle the loyalists in Digby. And he was initially granted land here too, but I don't know if he found the going too tough, but he relocated when the province of New Brunswick was created in 1784 due to the great number of loyalists there. Uh, he moved to New Brunswick and became a justice of the peace, uh, a registrar of deeds and a politician in Westmoreland County, New Brunswick. Okay. And so what was that, 
the, at that typical, would there be, would you normally have to go all the way to Halifax? I mean, that, that's a, a fair trip, even in a car nowadays, if you, um, you know, let alone uh, walking or other means to, to, to get court actions settled. Well, I mentioned that that grant, that Hatfield grant, the, the reason for it was that um, a petition was signed by many of the loyalists in Digby County and presented by their member of the House of Assembly. Uh, normally, that's the way it would be done. Uh, and, the house, and requesting that the township be resurveyed simply because of the confusion with the original grants and the property lines and boundaries and there were some people occupying land that in the wrong location uh, and the loyalists themselves couldn't afford to do that, uh, the cost of having the survey done. So under pressure from the, the people of Digby, the government had a new survey done uh, and <clears throat> it was named Hatfield because uh, the Hatfield family was a large uh, loyalist family who received sizable land grant. Okay. And did that survey wind up like what kind of effect did it, did it actually cause um, more dispersion or movement of people to, because well, they it, were it in was, the wrong spots? It was, it was needed and it, it, it helped, I think. But uh, in some places, I mean, I practiced law in, in Digby for many years and uh, surveyors, uh, some surveyors refused to go down to Long Island or Westport because when the survey was done for those islands, originally the surveyor didn't go there. He looked at the islands on a piece of paper and divided it up. So they found out when you go down there, uh, there's actually uh, less land than what the map shows, you see, because the map doesn't correspond to with what's on the ground. So you have lots overlapping each other and property boundaries overlapping each other. So it's a, a surveyor's nightmare to try to figure out uh, who is entitled to what. So then they get into arguments over possession, you know, and, and examples of what's been used and where their boundary line was and how long did they have it there for and the rest of it. So it's still causing issues today. Yes. Uh, wow. Um, well, that's, I guess, one one lasting impact of the, the Loyalist settlement there for sure. Um, but the the other thing that the Loyalists did by coming here, and although it was difficult, they contributed greatly to the infrastructure. Um, members of the, the first families uh, were involved in building the first road to Weymouth, the first road to Bear River, um, establishing infrastructure for the town to encourage new immigrants when they came to the area to remain. Now, I'm trying to remember, it's been a while since I've been to Digby and, and spent any amount of time actually in the town. Um, are there the houses in, of some of these original settlers, are they still there and are, are they like prominently marked? So, um, unfortunately, unfortunately, Digby had uh, some major fires that swept through here uh, and everything was wooden. Uh, and if you want to see original uh, Loyalist era buildings, there's a street uh, in Annapolis Royal, 20 minute drive away. And just around the corner from uh, Fort Ann on George Street, uh, there are several houses that are marked as homes. There's an information board across across from the homes, identifying them. The Bailey House is one of them. Uh, and they can be seen online as well. Okay, yes, I remember those from Annapolis Royal visiting there. Um, okay, well, that's a, it's all quite interesting. I really am, am, am enjoying this. Now, talking about the Loyalists in general in Nova Scotia, you mentioned you're the president of the Loyalist Association. Um, now, I know that there's um, a designation, somebody, if they have loyalty um, heritage, they can get. Um, how, just asking, how does a, a person start start that? Where's the best place to, to start if I want to prove that my ancestor is this loyalist? Uh, 
besides the gene if I have all my genealogical evidence there, what do I need to do? You're referring to the uh, Dorchester's uh, resolution uh, of yeah. the UE. Yeah. Um, at, the, at the end of the American Revolution, uh, Sir Guy Carleton, Lord Dorchester, uh, he wanted to recognize the contribution of the Loyalists and he indicated that uh, those who had uh, served could use the initials UE uh, as a post-nominal, UE standing for United Empire. Now, interestingly enough, the UE, United Empire, was first used uh, prior to the American Revolution um, by uh, a drinking establishment in Boston of, of people that were loyal to the United Empire. However, uh, when this began, it, it was started at the time Dorchester was dealing with land grants in Ontario, and it was intended uh, to be of assistance. And in Ontario, they actually picked up on it. And in the original land grants, you'll see, like for my ancestor, it mentions he, James Humphrey UE, received these lands. Uh, Ontario was the only province to uh, use this and to they established lists of UE. Uh, and Sir John uh, Grave Simcoe uh, continued with that uh, in the 1800s. Um, it wasn't really used and didn't appear in the literature uh, in the Maritimes until the 1800s and then they picked up on it. But you see the United Empire Loyalist Association provides uh, a certificate of descent and on that certificate of descent, it refers to this Dorchester resolution and the UE. And that's how people that make the association. In order to receive a certificate of descent, you can only receive one if you first belong to a branch of the association. There are 28 branches across Canada and a virtual branch on the internet, um, which people can join and for a, a small fee, in their area probably of uh, depends on a family membership or single membership but it's well under a hundred dollars uh, you will be assisted by a branch genealogist who will provide you with the forms uh, and generally what you have to show is your connection back to this original person who there is evidence to show was loyal to the crown during the american revolution so the evidence they ideally want to see are uh, birth, death, marriage certificates. Uh, however, that type of evidence was not available around the close of the American Revolution. So it's, it's easiest if your ancestor was uh, in the military, as in my case, because then they appear in a muster roll. Uh, so I was able to find him in the muster roll. Uh, and then as well, he's re re referred to in the list of grant. Um, and those grants are now online, uh, Public Archives of Canada, on their website. They have the, all of the grants and, and they're searchable. So people can look up that and find um, those ancestors. Okay. But it's really a, a, a process of getting together the right documentation and paperwork. Uh, you may be also assisted in that because the association has been going on for over 100 years, it was founded in 1914. And in the last de two decades, there's been a tremendous uh, increase in interest in, in finding one's roots in genealogy. The branch you join or another branch may already have proven you're a loyalist. Uh, and if they've already proven you're a loyalist, uh, that can be of assistance to you. Uh, in, if they're willing to share the information with you, you'll be able to just connect uh, the most of it back. It'll just be the more recent years uh, to your own uh, identification. So do these associations, at least they have branch genealogists and stuff, do they have, you know, records that it, it'd make it worthwhile for a person if they're interested in pursuing that, uh, becoming a member that they would have, have access to, um, more sets of records that might just not be available publicly? Every branch, yes, every branch does keep uh, all their applications. Okay. 
uh, and the records, and as well, they're stored in at Dominion office okay. uh, in Toronto. And there is a, a list right now, it's being updated, but online on the uh, website of the association, there's a loyalist list. Uh, and it has, it includes uh, proven loyalists as well as ones that are uh, possibly loyalists. But I've, some, some members will include their information. I've included my information there. So if someone had the same ancestor as me, they would be able to go there and open it up and it's all there. They could, they could find the route all the way back to their loyalist ancestor. Okay. That's, uh, I mean, I know uh, in, the, in the United States, a lot of these associations type things are, are important to people, but I know they, they do actually help in your overall genealogical um, research because um, they might have, like I said, that, that information that you kind of are, are, are missing or um, so. Well, an example, Brian, of, of this was I, I know of some people who have say four loyalist uh, uh, ancestors and, and, and these four, uh, the four, two might be in Nova Scotia and two might be in Ontario. Yeah. Well, in order to assist in their research, they'll join several branches. They join the Nova Scotia branch, uh, knowing that the branch genealogist here will have the expertise and the access to the records and may have even proven their ancestor before. And then the branch in Ontario uh, with the same hope. Okay. That, I mean, that definitely makes sense, uh, especially like you said, when we were talking earlier with some of the the dispersions and the, the different groupings of where they wound up going. Um, so you you just finished this book and I, um, so what else do you have coming down the pipeline? Well, I've, I've been doing more detailed research on the loyalists uh, in this area. And, and one of the common questions I'm always asked is about the someone can't find any information on their particular loyalist. So there are, you can find your loyalist if he received a land grant, um, but quite often they didn't stay long enough to get the grant. They arrived here and they were assigned the lot, but they left for Ontario or back to the States or, or somewhere else before then. And in some records like the, you can find the assignment. So I'm, I'm, been looking at some of those lately now uh, and, and giving some thought to putting together uh, another book which would would list these loyalists that uh, are difficult to find because they don't necessarily appear in the land records or the registries but they were part of the movement from the United States to Canada. Okay speaking of that if I was for instance uh, a lo uh, somebody that was settled in Digby but I couldn't have hacked the the winter. Would I then be able to go apply for another grant in a different area of Canada, or was that common? Or if I had uh, applied for that grant, even if I didn't use it, I was sort of um, out of the loop. I was uh, out of luck. It depends on the the circumstance. Uh, some of them stayed for a short time. Some of them stayed for uh, decades. Uh, if they became established and they sold their land, you see, uh, then they, they'd be carrying on. Initially, it, and it would depend on their documentation as to what they were eligible to, to receive. Uh, generally speaking, no. Uh, a lot of them, when they moved around, did so uh, just because of, of survival. You know, and if, when they, but at this time, Ontario was opening up too, you see, and, and they were looking to encourage people from not just loyalists, but uh, sometimes people that came from the States that are referred to as late loyalists. Uh, they came up during the 1790s or 1800s, you see, uh, and they didn't receive these land grants. But uh, why, why did they come? Because they, they, they didn't want to live under the American. There, there was also this, a lot of people, British, didn't think that the American Republic would survive. They thought that in a few years, they would come back to the UK asking them to take them back in again. That uh, the, 
it was considered to be, you know, like mob rule, uh, this experience with democracy. I, I know a few Americans that still think that. I think they're still waiting for the, the UK to, to come back, uh, you know, um, I, I, have seen a, the meme with the, the queen wearing the, the red baseball cap that says make make America great Britain again. Um, so the, uh, so there wouldn't have been that much of that. Um, now just the sort of the last couple of questions I, I was thinking about tying in with your, the previous book we talked about the, the Ulster Scots. Um, now, you mentioned a, a few Irish um, people that were um, that were loyalists. Now, would they have also tended to be Ulster Scots, or, or or would they be the mix of the Irish and the Protestant Scots that would be uh, have come over? Well, judging by the surnames, uh, there definitely were some Ulster Scots. However, I think that. Uh, they came from all over Ireland. I mean, given this time period, you have to remember that that uh, Ireland itself has evolved and changed. Yeah. You know, at, at one time Dublin, um, I mean, the Guinness Brewery, and uh, there were a great number of, of Anglo-Irish or or Scotch-Irish uh, living in uh, Dublin area, uh, and in the same throughout uh, other parts of Ireland, and. I, I believe that when Ireland was part of the British Empire, uh, young Irish would serve in, in British regiments around the world. And that may be a way that some of them ended up in America, you know, and that they carried on as loyalists after that service uh, and came here. But there are there other examples, as I mentioned, that Henry Rutherford, who teamed up with, with uh, George Nash uh, in Digby. Uh, he is supposed to have come from, from Cork, but they were both Presbyterians, according to initially, but, but they're, they changed to Anglican and they're buried in the Trinity Church there, possibly because, I mean, Anglican was the state religion. Yeah. Uh, and that was the, if you, if you wanted to be part of the community and active in the community, that, that was your only choice. And there wasn't a, a lot of other established churches until of Protestant churches necessarily until a little bit after. Uh, yes, uh, although there, there was an infusion of Scots, I noticed interestingly enough, and there was a, a Methodist church and a Presbyterian church that got established next in Digby. Okay, so following the Loyalists. So, and I know I didn't, we didn't really bring this up, but you brought it up through the thing when. You think of Digby, a lot of people know that the town, it's also the county, and it's the wider county where we're talking about the, the settlement in general. Um, and again, it's- that's, that's, that's right. As I was mentioning, some of the, some of the uh, loyalists in Digby who didn't remain traveled in other, to other parts of the township, to Weymouth, uh, and also down to Sandy Cove and Tiverton and Westport. And some went directly to Weymouth when they first arrived. Uh, then it was on the Sisabu River. There was another community there, New Edinburgh, named after Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, which failed. It was started up, uh, actually, the concept for it before Digby. Uh, and Bishop Inglis, Charles Inglis, who uh, I mentioned in the, in the book on Canada's Ulster Scots, uh, he actually was on the initial uh, list of, of owners of land. They laid out a town lot for New Edinburgh. Uh, it's just on the other side of the Sisabu River at the, at the mouth of the harbor coming, the mouth of the river coming into Weymouth. Um, if you think about crossing the bridge there into Clare, it would be on the Clare side of Digby County. Well, up until the early 1900s, I've read that you could still walk New Edinburgh and find the old streets. It was all laid out. Wow. Uh, but, but this community only lasted about 15 years uh, due to its location possibly, uh, and it wasn't able to encourage new settlement. 
and it was the old title issue thing. There were already some Acadians living in the area uh, who had claimed to some of the land. But it was called New Edinburgh because the group of loyalists coming from New York who decided to settle there, the group of four were all from Scotland. And uh, I guess they wanted to recall their homeland when they came to Nova Scotia. I mean, definitely they were moving to New, New Scotland, so might as well have a, a New Edinburgh there, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I do want to thank you, Brian. It, it was a pleasure uh, as always. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, to more, uh, more coming from you in, in books. Uh, so where, where, can I, where can I get your new book? I know it's av available on Amazon. Is, uh... Well, it's, it's available online and as well, it will be, as I mentioned in the Admiral Digby Museum in Digby, uh, I'm also providing uh, signed copies, autographed copies to people. Uh, if they uh, want to contact me, uh, I'll be happy to make arrangements with them. And, and they can probably find me through, I'm on Instagram. Okay. Uh, uh, and just send me a message uh, and I'll be happy to assist them. And I'll definitely link, I'll link that to, in my show notes here uh, on the podcast. I really do appreciate you coming today. It was great talking to you again. And you have a, you have a great day. Thanks for the opportunity, Brian. Bye. And same to you. Yeah, that really was a, a a great a great interview. I learned a lot, and I hope hope you got something out of it too. Uh, I'm inviting you to just 